Hello, everyone. Welcome to another lecture for English 2090. So today we we'll, are we'll going into uh, Gus Van Zandt and then really focusing on a cornerstone of kind of indie film, uh, the 90s and a little bit of the late 80s. So we, we're looking at his influence in terms of an explosion of American independent cinema, really uh, for about a decade and a half. So as we've been discussing, while American cinema has always had an independent kind of um, you know, sideline right for the, against the Hollywood system. It really existed since the birth of film. Gus Van Zandt heavily influenced the style and look to American independent films for a decade, about a decade and a half, but really for the late 80s, 90s, and just a little bit early 2000s. His directorial debut, which we're watching, Malanoche, and his second feature, Drugstore Cowboy, heavily shaped how writers and directors crafted independent films in terms of a few important aspects. Taboo subject matter, of course, Avant-garde film have always really focused on, you know, taboo subject matter, but this was now treated in terms of very serious approach, right? They weren't trying to make campy films. They weren't trying to make exploitation films. They were trying to make legitimate films, right, that went against the Hollywood system, but really sincerely focused on stories that haven't been told yet. So especially if you've seen American indie films in the 90s, they're going to be heavily focused on homosexual characters, bisexual characters, transgender characters, women, you know, African-Americans, Hispanics, you know, minorities of all sorts, Native American. There's a huge um, Native American independent uh, film that's happening in this time, too. So they're doing a lot of important kind of subject matter that you don't see in Hollywood. And again, they're treating it seriously, not the in the exploitation way. A cornerstone of indie film, especially in the 90s, heavily stylized cinematography, even for comedies, right, that were just meant to just be, you know, pure entertainment. If it's an independent film in the in 90s, it's going to be heavily focused on that mise-en-scene concept where every shot is trying to be very artistic, right, and very hyper-stylized. You're always going to hear alternative rock and hip hop soundtracks to these movies. Hollywood copies that. Um, you know, it really is so crucial um, that, especially in the 90s, you could know it's a 90s film because it's alternative. You know, um, whether it's hip hop or rock or whatever, it's always going to be alternative in some form or another. An important aspect, too, is the focus on the auteur theory which I mentioned briefly with the Roger Corman one, but he's responsible for really introducing it to a generation of filmmakers at this time. So consider the most prominent auteur in what's called new queer cinema. He inspired generations of filmmakers to use the auteur theory or method of filmmaking. It originates from theater. So this term is nothing new in terms of academic kind of scholarly discussions. If you're very interested in theater studies, it's from Bazin, and it really looks at how, you know, stage designers will have a certain kind of characteristic quality to them that you could tell it's their set pieces and so forth. It originates in European cinema and is heavily advocated by Francois Truffaut, who is a very important director and critic as well. And it really starts during the 1950s, this term being thrown around. It commonly refers to filmmakers or directors with a recognizable style, right? If if they didn't have that directed by tagline, you would still know it's one of their films, right? And there's also typical thematic preoccupations as well. So for Gus Van Zandt, for example, he's really focused on almost every movie he makes, even when he's in the Hollywood system, is about homosexual characters or homosexual identity or something. So all these kind of thematic preoccupations exist, as well as style. Like you can tell that it, the way the angles are and so forth, that it's this director. These filmmakers maintain complete control over writing, directing, and editing, too, typically in their tour, even if they're not the sole editor, they're going to be present in the editing room. They're going to be present during the second unit shoots, if, if they even have that, right? So it's very important to kind of look at how filmmakers, because in a Hollywood system, you know, you're directing, you have a second unit, third unit sometimes, you have director of photography, you, and you're not really paying attention to every aspect. You're not in the room when they're editing the film and so forth. That's why we have director's cuts versus non-director's cuts, right? So Hollywood system, you know, 
divides it much more specifically, right? But our tours typically, even if they go to more mainstream movies like Gus Van Zandt did, they still maintain control over every facet of filmmaking. So it has a more kind of specific feel to it that other films may not have. So a couple of recognizable uh, tours, Alfred Hitchcock, right? And a lot of times you'll hear and see directors using the same actors in various roles. You know, so these auteurs have a very look to them thematically, genre wise, style, everything, right, involved. Um, Stanley Kubrick, uh, of course, uh, one of the most uh, prominent auteurs as well. You know, you know you're watching a Kubrick film, whether it's horror, sci fi, war, sex, right? You know, you, you know you're watching a Kubrick film. Jordan Peele is definitely probably one of the most up and coming auteurs, right? He only has two movies so far, but they have a very distinct style. And he is, and he, well, he subscribes himself to be an auteur. So chances are that more movies he makes will have the same similar style, even if they're different genres. The Coen Brothers, if you've ever seen any of those films, again, the dialogue, the actors, the, the way actors act and perform in these movies are very similar, whether it's a crime drama, whether it's a comedy about bowling, whether it is a comedy about a couple trying to have a baby, they have a very similar style. The soundtracks are very similar and so forth. Sofia Coppola, another auteur, you know, um, it, again, independent as well as Hollywood system filmmaker, but all of her films have a certain look to them. They have a certain soundtrack to them and so forth. Wes Anderson is probably the most mocked as well as celebrated auteur of modern day. Um, his movies are celebrated by hipsters and then either rejected by mainstream audiences or celebrated by mainstream audiences. He kind of runs the gambit. Some of his films are very critically acclaimed and well-respected by mainstream audiences. Others are just hipsters, love them, and everybody else hates them. But but you know you're watching a Wes Anderson film. You know, again, his soundtracks are almost the same for every movie. You know, the themes are the same in terms of white, sad men. You know, they, they're you know in love with women who don't love them. And very typical um, and for some people, very repetitive um, stuff. So, you know, here and but again, except for obviously Kubrick and Hitchcock, all these sets of directors are very influenced by Gus Van Zandt, you know, um, because he really pushed the auteur style. And so it's really important to kind of look at kind of Zandt's uh, influence, but of course, you know, talk more about independent film. During the 90s, one of the reasons, and several reasons why American independent cinema really flourished. So the rise of grunge music very really helped. Equally important, the politically infused hip hop, you know, Public Enemy, NWA, right? Very important kind of anti establishment music, of course, is going to fuel then anti establishment cinema. And of course, vice versa. They're going to have a very symbiotic relationship. The creation of anti Hollywood and anti corporate film festivals. So, um, one of the main kind of ways to get films made, and we'll talk about this a little bit when we look at Charles Band and Terrorvision, you know, is to get your film screened at a film festival. Of course, the problem in a lot of the film festivals is they're super expensive and they really just cater to famous people. So during the 90s and, and actually during the late 80s, I should say, too, um, you see the rise of these film festivals that are very anti Hollywood that, you know, it cost only $50 to put in your film instead of thousands. And so, you know, it, a very important aspect. And so they've had a lot of anti corporate. Now, some of them are, are very corporate nowadays, but they were at the time very anti corporate and very anti Hollywood. And so these film festivals really help raise awareness. Another aspect too is especially even before these movies took off because they, you know, run in similar circles, famous actors like Bruce Willis and John Travolta in Quentin Tarantino's films really started, you know, pulling mainstream audiences in. So a lot of actors wanted to take riskier roles, a lot of you know, and you know, again, a very, you know, if you're Native American, black, all that, you know, you could all of a sudden now be a star in a movie where in a Hollywood system you couldn't. So you see that. Uh, many studies uh, brought and absorbed independent studios. So you see that kind of aspect. So um, what happens is that studios 
absorb in the late 90s um, and early 2000s, absorb these independent studios. So they actually create specific divisions which create more art-focused movies. So even though the kind of indie route is somewhat gone, some of these former independent companies still work on their own within um, the American system. So it's a very interesting aspect to it. Um, art house films still continue to flourish. There's still a huge amount of indie film, you know, even in, you know, the 21st century. And one example would be The Room. And again, you know, mock, reviled, celebrated, and all sorts of things. Another Get Out, you know, Bloom, um, uh, yeah, Bloomhouse, um, huge independent studio. They, um, again, cost very little to make, but a lot of them, like Purge, for example, and Get Out, make huge amounts of money. And so there's a lot of avenues for independent cinema even today. And again, you know, Gus Van Zandt really started, look at Get Out and look at The Room, these heavy stylized films. And so, you know, he really influenced a lot of filmmakers. Obviously, if you have any questions, you know, email or post to the Canvas forum. If not, just good luck with all the other assignments and take care.